fall of Rome in the West. In his monumental work, The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, historian Edward Gibbon laid a large part of the blame on Christianity, and for decades that view dominated the popular view of history of the 5th century Europe. Christianity certainly played a role in the course of events in Europe during that time, and I'm loath to contend with such an eminent and erudite scholar as Mr. Gibbon, but the Roman Empire did not fall in the 5th century when barbarians overran the West. As we've seen in previous episodes, the Empire continued on quite nicely, thank you, in the East for another thousand years. What we see in Gibbons is the Western provincialism typical of an 18th century European. He largely disregards the Eastern Empire once the West fell. This despite the fact that the Eastern Empire continued to identify itself as Roman for hundreds of years. And as for Christianity being the most significant cause for the West's fall, wait a minute. Christianity was no less in place in the East as in the West. In fact, we can make a case for saying that it was even more ensconced in the Eastern seat of power. After all, while the church and state remained largely separate in the West, in the East, they merged. So why didn't the Eastern Empire fall to no less frequent and concerted attacks by so-called barbarians? The reasons the West fell while the East continued are numerous and far more complex than we have time to deal with here. Besides, this is a church history, not a history of the Roman Empire podcast. For that, you want to listen to Mike Duncan's excellent The History of Rome. Gibbons justifies his position by saying that the Christian faith encouraged chastity and abstinence, resulting in a population decline within the empire. That meant less men for the army, and those men who did enlist were influenced by a pacifism taught by the church that didn't want to fight. They were all a bunch of 5th century hippies. Make love, not war, bruh. Gibbons' assumption is that at the same time, the barbarians popped out warriors like rabbit attack rabbits, amped to go to war as soon as they could swing a sword. But hold on, Mr. Gibbon. Those barbarians, weren't they Christians too? Now, Aryan Christians, to be sure, but weren't they of the same general moral stripe as the Romans that you claim were well, getting softened up and ready for the slaughter by a milk toast brand of religion? So why were the barbarians different? A far better cause to look for why the barbarians took down the West was the pressure that they were facing from other barbarians invading their territory. It was easier and, quite frankly, far more tempting to just vacate territory being invaded by bloodthirsty savages from distant lands and move towards the rich pickings of a decadent and largely now undefended empire. An empire where the quality of governing officials had so declined well, the people would rather be ruled by barbarians than the rapacious, brutal, and corrupt officials sent by Rome, or Milan, or Ravenna, or wherever the Western capital now sat. So, did Christianity contribute to the fall of the empire in the West? Well, some of Gibbon's criticisms may have merit. But whatever factors the church contributed to weakening the empire were certainly offset by the benefits the faith brought. As we've seen already, had it not been for the church and its very capable bishops, entire regions would have gone without any governance whatsoever. What would have happened to Rome if Pope Leo hadn't convinced Attila and his Hunnish hordes to turn back? Oh, what would have happened to the city had he not convinced the Vandals to limit their deprivations to just looting? Now, to be sure, the percentage of genuine believers in the empire was small, but their influence was growing, and Christianity began to alter the culture of the empire in both the East and the West. In the mid-5th century, an elder of the church at Marseille named Southian wrote a book titled The Government of God. He wanted to answer the same question that the great Augustine of Hippo had wrestled with. Why did Rome fall? Why would God bring suffering on a Christian people? You'll remember that Augustine's answer to that perplexing problem that everyone was talking about was his book, The City of God. Salvian said that the suffering of Christians in Gaul at the hands of invaders was not a measure of God's just rule. It was his judgment on the wicked autocrats and greedy officials who'd mercilessly oppressed the poor. Salvian is unique because until this time, writers tended to denigrate the common man in favor of the rich and the powerful. After all, who bought books in those days? Salvian wrote for fellow believers to help make sense of what they saw every day at the hands of barbarian invaders. He said that God had let them in because the rich landowners and civil officials were corrupt and abused the common people. 
Well, the case that he makes is simplistic. It did contain a measure of truth that others quietly thought, but, well, they feared to voice. Contrary to Salvian's picture, the common man wasn't all a mass of innocence, nor were all officials corrupt. There were exceptions on both sides. But a new note had been struck in the old question of why Rome fell. And from that point on, the church began to take an increasingly larger role of being the voice of the common people. The church had always put a priority on charity and taking care of the poor, but it had rarely spoken out against the unjust policies of civil officials that deprived people of their rights and property. But now it began to. The city of Rome was in the habit of evicting non-citizens in times of famine, but Bishop Ambrose worked to change the policy so that they would instead be provided for. A similar policy was adopted at Edessa, as well as a 300-bed hospital, all at the urging and with the assistance of believers in the city. Now, this is not to say that in some places the church was part of the problem rather than the solution. In Sicily, for instance, church officials were oppressive in the way that they exacted taxes from the commoners who worked church lands. But when Pope Gregory found out about it, he moved quickly to correct that problem. Historians have long debated the efficacy of the Christian faith on the morality of the empire. The tendency among advocates of the faith is to attribute too much influence to the church, while critics scoff and say that the church had no impact on morals. The truth, as usual, lies somewhere in between. We know that it was the influence of Christianity that brought an end to the gladiatorial combats. But the ever-popular chariot racing, wild animal hunts, and the incredibly immoral theaters you know, they carried on despite regular sermons that were preached against them. The theater was so bawdy that some emperors banned it. But they carried on in secret, knowing that the next emperor might very well lift the ban. One realm of morality that experienced a major overhaul was sexual ethics. The modern and popular conception of the late Roman Empire is that it was marked by lax sexual mores. TV miniseries have played this up to boost their ratings. While the imperial palace and homes of the wealthy were occasional scenes of moral debauchery, the common people were not given over to rampant sexual license. Society then was much like society now. What Christianity did was to elevate marriage in the status of women. Also, for the first time, virginity for both men and women was valued as a virtue. While marriage was held as sacred, the idea of staying single and choosing a life of celibacy so that a man or a woman could devote themselves wholly to Christ became a, well, a regular part of the Christian community. Pagans considered this odd and another mark that set the Christians apart. Sexual intercourse outside of marriage was forbidden. Violators were excluded from the church. When the number of those excluded grew, well, it was decided to allow them back into fellowship after they had demonstrated public repentance and done the required penance. As time passed and the idea of celibacy grew, even sex within marriage was edited. It was thought that it should only be engaged in to produce children. Finding pleasure in marital sex was deemed by some church leaders, themselves celibate of course, as sinful. Sex between a husband and a wife was to be endured to produce children, not enjoyed to build intimacy. Too bad they didn't take the Song of Solomon at face value and apply what the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 7. The Christian view of marriage had a significant impact on Roman customs. Because it was considered a sacred covenant, divorce was forbidden except in the case of adultery. By Roman law, a woman was not allowed to marry a man beneath her social rank. If she did, her status was lowered to her husband's level. He was never elevated to hers. In the early 3rd century, Pope Callistus not only eased the rule for sexual offenses, he declared as legal the marriage of men and women from any social level. Under the Roman law of paterfamilias, the male head of household had absolute authority over his family and estate to literally do with as he pleased. Technically, he had the power to beat and even execute his wife, children, and servants. And I say technically because while the rule of paterfamilias did grant a father that right, being an abusive brute, killing his family members, that was frowned on. What paterfamilias did was to denigrate the value of women and children. Christianity fundamentally altered that. Not only were women elevated as co-heirs of Christ with men, children were valued as parents were charged now with the stewardship of raising them to the glory of God. The practice of exposing unwanted infants on a hillside, a common Roman and Greek custom, was forbidden for Christians, as was abortion 
when non-Christians would go to a hillside to leave their unwanted offspring there, Christians would come out from nearby hiding places to rescue them before the wild beasts could carry them away. They were then raised in Christian homes. As the church grew, more people came to faith in Christ from all occupations and levels of society. The impact of the faith began to be felt across a wide spectrum. Many believers found it difficult to live in a secular world. When a civil magistrate came to faith, how was he to order the torture or execution of someone who before his conversion he wouldn't have thought twice for? So some thought to solve this dilemma by saying that Christians couldn't serve public office, meaning those who did serve in that capacity couldn't be followers of Christ and so were void of the virtues of a believer. This had to have contributed to the decline in morality that marked the late empire, especially the morality of governmental administrators, who became rapacious and brutal tyrants. We think of men like Ambrose and Gregory, who had been magistrates before they left office to become leaders in the church. The church attracted the best and the brightest who before would have gone into public office, men like Athanasius and Augustine. There were hundreds who became bishops rather than governors and prefects. It was an ancient form of brain drain that weakened the civil order of the empire. These church leaders were more concerned to build Augustine's city of God than to help shore up the sagging walls of the city of man. And, of course, the barbarians were waiting just outside those walls to tear them down. This, more than anything else, is what contributed to the fall of Western, uh, the Western Empire. During the 3rd and 4th centuries, governmental policies saw a massive shift of people from being producers to consumers. By the dawn of the 5th century, the imbalance was simply unsupportable. The army had doubled in size to deal with the barbarian threat. As is the nature of a government bureaucracy, it had mushroomed dr uh, drastically. But producers like farmers and manufacturers had dropped significantly. The cost of doing business rose steeply, consuming profits. Farmland was either threatened by invasion or stolen by elites who knew how to work the system to avoid paying their fair share of taxes. All of this burdened the government at the same time as, as impoverishing it. And wouldn't you know it, it was right at that time that new barbarian groups decided to have a go at the old girl named Rome. Many of the commoners of the Western Empire weren't really all that worried about the barbarians. They were ready for change since their Roman overlords had become brutal and rapacious. A change in regime sounded kind of good to them. So out of frustration with the civil authorities in Rome, Pope Gregory negotiated with the Lombards. The Christians submitted to barbarian political rule and then promptly converted those barbarians to the faith. So... Christianity may indeed have contributed in a small way to the fall of the Western Empire, but the question is, was it really worth saving? Was history set back by Rome's demise? If Rome's fall was Christianity's fault, how then did the church become the repository of culture and the treasury of civilization and emerge as one of the dominant institutions in the centuries that followed? The barbarians may have conquered the Western Empire, but the church soon conquered them.